In the last few years, so many different terrestrial planets have been discovered in a lot of different star systems out there, with some of these planets potentially being in areas where they can be habitable and maybe even host life. But one thing that makes those planets very different from planet Earth is actually the star that they orbit. Without exception, all of them were actually discovered around a typical red dwarf. The much cooler and much smaller stars that represent the most common types of stars in the galaxy and possibly even the universe. With stars like Gliese 229a that you see right here, essentially representing about 75% of all of the stars in the Milky Way with only maybe about 10% of all of the stars being similar to our Sun, G-type stars. Which to many modern astronomers creates a bit of a paradox and a bit of a mystery. So back in the 60s, back in the 70s, when for example Carl Sagan would talk about planet Earth and life on planet Earth, he would often mention that we're just living on a regular planet in a very typical star system and nothing really makes our star system anything special. Yet modern observations seem to actually dispute that. We seem to live around a relatively rare type of a star, because if we were living around a very typical star, we would be living in a red dwarf system, with the surface of our planet and also the skies of our planet being very different. The red skies. And so some scientists today have actually coined the term red sky paradox. Or basically the question here is that why is it that we don't live around a red dwarf? Why did the life and specifically humanity evolve around such an unusual or somewhat rare type of a star known as G-type. And more importantly, can we ever actually find any life around red dwarfs? Now in some of the previous videos we've discussed many of these ideas already, with the overall conclusion being that, well, it's actually probably unlikely. For example, in one of the recent videos we've discussed the idea of photosynthesis actually most likely not even being possible around a typical red dwarf. The light produced by these types of stars doesn't really produce the right colors for photosynthesis to be effective or to provide enough energy for complex life to then evolve. It does produce enough red light and so some types of photosynthesis from for example certain bacteria is possible, but for more effective photosynthesis such as the one we have on Earth, it would be practically impossible. Now on top of that, not so long ago, the scientists revealed the discovery of TRAPPIST-1 system, the most exciting red dwarf system discovered to date. We're actually going to be talking more about the system very soon when James Webb reveals its images, but in a nutshell, it's a system with seven terrestrial planets orbiting a red dwarf. And so it's actually become a prime target for scientists to try to find some kind of a habitable planet in here. And possibly not just habitable, but inhabited by something especially because these stars have a potential to survive for up to a trillion years, tens or even hundreds times longer than G-type stars like our Sun. Which at least in theory means that if there is something habitable here, it's going to stay the same for a very 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 long time. But yet, there's still that question, why is it that we don't live around a red dwarf? Why are our skies not red? How can we resolve this unusual paradox? And does this paradox imply that maybe we're not going to find any life around red dwarfs. Well, at the moment there are several potential resolutions and very recently the scientists released this paper right here that explored this idea even more, providing even more potential resolution. And so what are these possible resolutions? A few years ago the initial resolution was that maybe all of the red dwarfs are just way too active. Even though they're quite cool and can live for a pretty long time, something about their activity and the chance for them to flare up and to create a lot of inhospitable conditions on those planets makes the possibility for life here very very low. These stars tend to flare up much more, they also tend to produce very very explosive emissions, even more powerful than our own sun, and because a lot of those planets are also much closer to the star than our own planet earth, they tend to receive hundreds or even thousands times more radiation, which ends up stripping big parts of atmosphere and potentially removing a lot of other things from the surface that would make these planets habitable or create conducive conditions for life. There's also a question of tidal locking. Most of the planets in these systems, because of their proximity to the star, are tidally locked. Which very likely results in a lot of these planets maybe looking like this. These are known as eyeball planets. Although that's assuming there's water. If there's no water and just atmosphere, it might look something like this. Either way though, they would be very different from planet Earth and would have very inhospitable conditions in some parts of the planet and only have somewhat hospitable conditions maybe on the edges in the so-called twilight zone right here. 
But whether that's enough to do anything in terms of formation of life or even making the planet habitable, that's of course a question we cannot answer. Either way, these will be very different planets and definitely not anything like what we have here in the solar system. And so there are just not enough conditions for any kind of life to develop, at least based on what we know so far. But just having different conditions is one of the potential explanations. A life by itself could also be just extremely rare everywhere. In other words, one of the other resolutions is what's known as rare Earth hypothesis. And completely by chance, it happened around a G-type star, which is our Sun. But until further observations from other objects, this particular explanation is going to be extremely difficult to disprove, which kind of makes it a little bit unscientific. It's a good hypothesis, quite interesting, but not something we can easily prove or disprove. Which I guess takes us to the next explanation. Maybe a typical red dwarf, because it has a lifespan in trillions of years, just takes much much longer to develop, and so for life to form around these objects and for conditions to become more habitable, we just require much much longer times, and so none of these objects just form life yet. And so with time, as these objects become slightly warmer, and as they stop their flaring and become more passive, the planets in these star systems can start to stabilize and potentially acquire more habitable conditions, eventually maybe even evolving life, including more complex life like ourselves. But this new study focuses on something else. It also focuses on what makes the solar system so different from a lot of these red dwarf systems and also a lot of other systems out there. For example, we have quite a lot of giant planets, such as Jupiter. And today it's believed that most red dwarfs are probably incapable of forming these planets and thus do not have the same types of effects around those star systems. And specifically, in our solar system, Jupiter's gravity has quite a lot of effect on many different objects, including various types of large asteroids, that Jupiter tends to move around the solar system, very often protecting planet Earth from dangerous collisions, but also sometimes in other cases, dislodging some of the asteroids from the asteroid belt, and having them collide with the planet, which despite being dangerous for life, also delivers a lot of materials to the surface. But more importantly, none of these red dwarfs would even have an asteroid belt to begin with. The main reason the asteroid belt exists in the solar system is because of the gravitational interaction of Jupiter, where the planet prevented some of these objects from forming into something else. Which means that in star systems like TRAPPIST-1 right here, because there are seven terrestrial planets with very stable orbits that seem to be also in resonance, first of all it implies there are no gas giants present here, because nothing seems to be destabilized, but second of all it also implies there is most likely no asteroid belt and thus no asteroid collisions with any of these planets. And at least a few studies in the past determined that the asteroid and comet bombardment definitively made the surface more hospitable, influencing certain chemical reactions on the surface, potentially creating plate tectonics on the surface, enriched the atmosphere of the planet, and transformed the surface just enough to make it chemically viable for life to evolve, while also maybe delivering quite a lot of water to the surface as well. And so without these particular delivery systems, these planets in the TRAPPIST-1 system, or really any red dwarf system out there, would probably be more or less empty and would also be very chemically inert on the surface, not just unable to support life, but possibly even unable to start any major chemical reaction that would result in life later on. With the study also determining that the late heavy bombardment that was responsible for delivering quite a lot of asteroids to various objects in the solar system, was most likely started by the interaction of Jupiter with a lot of extra materials in the solar system, resulting in the enrichment of planet Earth. But without Jupiter and without the asteroid belt, none of this would be possible. And so in order to determine if any of this was possible around red dwarfs, the scientists wanted to take a look at some of the known red dwarfs with planet around them to see if they can actually find signs of gas giants there. Because naturally by finding a gas giant, maybe we could find an object that experienced similar conditions to planet Earth. And out of 48 red dwarfs that they examined, with 27 of them having at least one exoplanet, they discovered that none of them had gas giants at all, as expected based on previous studies. And though statistically it's possible that some of them might have been just really really far away from the star, unless these gas giants were much closer, they would unlikely to have major effects on the star system and thus create the asteroid belts or create these collision events for various planets in the star system. Which of course once again implies that these red dwarf systems potentially have extremely different planets around them, planets that we actually have trouble imagining. 
But since we know that, at least for Earth, the asteroid belt collisions and just collisions in general were crucial for the delivery of life materials to the planet and of course for the beginning of life on the planet, if these particular planets get none of this, it just once again means that we might not be able to find any life around them anytime soon. Even if we ignore the fact that the stars here are different and that the planets tend to have very different orbits to planet Earth, Earth is actually unique in a lot of other ways as well. And one of the strangest things that makes Earth so unique is our moon. Earth's moon is extremely different from any other moon we've found so far and most likely is one of the main reasons why Earth was actually able to form life to begin with. We've discussed this in some of the other videos you might be able to find in the description, but just in a nutshell, based on all we know about the evolution and the formation of the moon, which most likely happened because of the collision of two smaller planets, early Earth and the object we refer to as Theia, we know that as soon as the moon formed, it produced huge effects on our planet. It was orbiting extremely close, it was also extremely bright, illuminating the planet even at night, and creating ridiculous tides on the surface. With all of this acting as a kind of a stir, with the chemicals on Earth being constantly moved around and shuffled around as the moon orbited every six hours. And that by itself was already enough to create some extreme conditions for chemistry on Earth, something that could be extremely difficult to reproduce elsewhere in the galaxy. So just another addition to that paradox that we cannot resolve right now. And so Earth just could be extremely rare. Why though? That's not a question we can answer yet. Until we learn something else or until new propositions, that's all I wanted to mention. Thank you for watching, subscribe, maybe share this with someone who has learned about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, and support this channel on Patreon by joining the channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.